Well, welcome to uh, the follow-up podcast this week. Um, my name is David Rickman. I've got my friend here, John William Blackwell, joining me for the conversation, and I um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, this week, we we looked at uh, the flood and the covenant with Noah, and uh, and we also looked at the curse of Canaan and Ham and Noah's sons and all of the events surrounding uh, Genesis 9. And we're going to look at some of these uh, different themes, really talk about the flood today a lot and um, see where the conversation goes. So, John, thanks for being with us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And um, if you guys will, we're going to start looking at Genesis 7. Um first and kind of look at the the account of the flood here in Genesis 7 verse 10 the we we went, we went through this narrative uh in in the class on Monday but it says that it came about after the 7 days that the water of the flood came upon the earth and in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And so this this event, um, as we talked about, um, really unique in in creation history, and uh, these the actual like mechanisms of, of what's going on with the flood itself. I think, um, John has a lot of good thoughts from his background in, uh, and a unique angle in looking at the the scriptures in, in this way. And so I wanted to pitch it over to John for him to be able to kind of talk about some of this mechanism with the flood and us look at that and have a conversation around, you know, what, what's going on here, or what are some of the proposals of, of what could have been happening? And, you know, how do we look at the instruction of this thing moving forward? So, Yeah, yeah, thanks, man. Um, so there, there's various sort of views of, of how this took place. Um, one you may have heard of is uh, it's the canopy theory. And so um, after creation, there was just this huge mass of, of water that surrounded the earth. Um, and when the flood occurred, just like rain, that sort of fell down and, and created this. But that doesn't account for what we picked up in the passage with the, the fountains of the great deep bursting forth. Um, and so there's uh, an individual by the name of Walt Brown. He's actually a retired Army officer, has a mechanical engineering degree from MIT. And he sort of studied the scriptures and thought about this. And, and he proposed um, something called the hydroplate theory. And hydro meaning water and plate. Uh, meaning, you know, shelf or like the concept of plate tectonics. And the view is that um, after creation, there was basically this large mass of water below the crust of the earth. Um, if you go through your basic science course, you're taught plate tectonics, which is like this this magma and um, basically lava that the, that the earth sits on um, or the, the, the land mass of the earth sits on. Um, but this view held that that prior to the flood, that these fountains of the deep o- occurred under the surface. And so what would happen at the flood is the rupture of this would form a tiny crack um, in the, the crust of the earth. Um, and this would just expand, you know, almost like a balloon popping. And it, uh, you know, he's done, <clears throat> excuse me, he's done all the math and, and whatnot, but it would like transverse the entire globe in like two hours. And so just, a you know, really cataclysmic event. Um, and the pressure would be built from just the time of creation to the time of the flood of um, this water's moving around and the, the tide tidal pumping is what he calls it based on the, the moon and, um, and, and gravity and, and whatnot. And so this creates a mechanism by which um, just large amounts of, of water, chunks of the earth, and all these things are propelled into the atmosphere. And then that actually forms uh, the rain that would fall for, for numerous days. Um, the, the view even holds that chunks of the earth, like formed, you know, comets and meteors and, and these things that, 
um, science would explain in a little, a little different way. I think an interesting piece with that is meteors have actually fallen back to the earth and they've had water and earth, you know, known bacteria and, and various things. And, and so you have the evolutionary model that would be like, see, there's bacteria sort of that's resistant. It can float around in space and it fell and then it formed in the soup and, you know, no, 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 we, we get to humans eventually. Um, but a more plausible explanation is just that this piece of earth that comes back down was actually, you know, originated on earth. Oh. Um, and so, uh, just continuing with the sort of, sort of the process, um, as this, uh, rupture occurred, it, it most likely separated the continents as, as we see them now and, and pushed these things away. And so, um, as the land masses are moving, you know, to our mind pretty rapidly, um, when they collide, that pushes up mountain ranges and the parts that are subducted form the deep ocean trenches. And, um, and so I'm not gonna, you know, die by this theory, but I think what it helps us do is, um, if we, we move the, the story in the scriptures from just this mythical thing that occurred into something that we can sort of attempt to wrap our minds around and, and grasp, then it gives us, um, just an appreciation that this was a real historical event. And like the Lord is, is serious about this judgment where, you know, you touched on on Monday, like 99.99% of life yeah. was destroyed. You throw the animals in there and, and stuff. It's even more. And I, I hope that what that does is it gives us an appreciation that the second judgment um, and the, the eschatological judgment is a real event and it would create urgency and um, just expectation in our hearts for that. Um, and the scriptures don't stop there. I, I think that it continues to be a motif of this judgment. Yeah. And I think you've kind of studied that out a little bit more. But um, I will say, if you're interested in any of this stuff, we'll throw some links and, uh, you know, videos are great. So there's actually a YouTube sort of that um, describes this and you can appreciate it more. Yeah, yeah that's so good. I think having that, the the real t some tangible mechanism mm -hmm. ideas around it just really helps it. Yeah. It, like you said, it helps it be more real to us and, you know, it helps inform that future looking and fear of God related to uh, the judgment events that are talking about at the eschaton, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, even that's that's the way, actually, we, we kind of mentioned a little bit on Monday, but um, in the scriptures, uh, the flood becomes kind of the prefiguring an object lesson for eschatological judgment. And it's used like that um, from through the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and also into the New Testament. It's a very um, prominent theme throughout. And so um, we, we wanted to kind of move our conversation forward into some passages around that just to look at um, where the flood is alluded to in the Tanakh and, um, and then, you know, what, what's going on around these passages and then how do we move that into the new Testament? And so, um, what, what's actually really interesting is that, uh, the flood, uh, the word is only used, uh, one time, uh, directly, um, for the, the same word that's used in Genesis, um, is used one time and it's in Psalm 29. Um, so if, it, if you look at Psalm 29, it, it starts out with, it's really interesting. It says, ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of the mighty, or other translations, the actual word here is the uh, B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. And so it even opens up with this idea of worship, the Lord, you sons of God, um, which that kind of brings us back to, you know, the Genesis six thing of, uh, the sons of God that we saw in Genesis six. So it connects it again to the flood. Um, and so it says, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord, the glory, do his name, worship the Lord in holy array. And then it starts talking about the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. It's majestic. It breaks the cedars and it goes into all of these things. And at the end here uh, in, in verse nine, it says, 
in his temple, everything cries glory. And then verse 10, the Lord sat as king of the flood, the, the deluge, the, the mabul is the Hebrew. Um, yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And so this, you know, it's interesting, this, this psalm uh, referencing, kind of tying in the sons of God and saying the Lord is the one who sat enthroned as king at the flood. He was the one doing the judgment. He was the one over all of these things. And, uh, and he sits as king forever. And so it's a, it's even an admonition to fear God as king forever and his past events of judgment and, and rule inform, you know, future events Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, the perspective of that. And so this, this Psalm is, uh, is definitely, uh, one of the major kind of, uh, worship Psalms that connect the theology related to the flood and, uh, and the fear of God with these, uh, sons of God worshiping Yahweh himself. And so, um, yeah, and another passage that doesn't actually include the language of the flood directly, um, is Isaiah 54 doesn't use the word flood, but, um, in Isaiah 54 verse nine through 10, it talks about the waters of Noah and it says, um, For this is like the days of Noah to me when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I've sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And this is is in reference to um, the Babylonian captivity and their return from the exile. But it's interesting that it actually has here just kind of this unqualified phrase of the waters of Noah, as if everybody knows what's going on with that. You know, it's it's part of the backstory of Israel's history, you know, and uh, and so it's uh, it's just there for everybody to see. And he's saying uh, that uh, I won't flood the earth again, referencing that covenant he made in Genesis 9 with uh, not not flooding the earth again. And so just, just like he will not do that again, he's sworn that he will not be angry or rebuke them, and he actually will lead them into restoration as a nation um, after their their time of exile. And so these are like the most kind of explicit references in the Hebrew Bible to the flood. But um, what's what's also interesting, and as we move forward, is that there's a lot of these uh, kind of more implicit references that aren't so straightforward, but it uses the language of the flood. It uses the ideas and the motifs around the flood, and um, it uses them in all of these contexts, basically. What's consistent all around is that they are in prophetic type passages and they they have connections to eschatology mm-hmm. and what's to come in the future and so uh the, it it's you can definitely see that they're functioning as you know this was a dress rehearsal mm-hmm. for what's coming this the instruction that comes from the beginning helps us to inform us on how to respond in the fear of god for what's coming in the future. And so uh, just uh, we'll, we'll look at a couple of these just like implicit ones and move towards the New Testament. But um, but Isaiah 24 through 26 in this this section of Isaiah, there's a couple little references throughout here that kind of allude to language around the flood. And it talks about how uh, men have like polluted the earth and they've broken the everlasting covenant in in verses five and six, and it says this curse devours the earth. And it has this like really intense language of judgment. And in verse 18, it talks about the windows of heaven are opened 
for for the judgment to come and um uh, and just a, a lot of the language of Isaiah 24 I mean even the passage opens up with uh this description of like bursting and and things splitting apart you know maybe like even some of the kind of things you were highlighting with uh yeah the, you you pick up verse 19 the earth is broken asunder the earth is split through the earth is shaken violently and yeah. and so maybe even the appreciation of that eschatological eschatological judgment um sheds light on on sort of the mechanism of the the first judgment yeah totally. because that wouldn't have any connection to the flood unless you sort of held that view. So that, that's really interesting to tie that in. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and these are just kind of like the language of it. I mean, these aren't like major mm-hmm. illusion, but they're just kind of like the using the motif of what's going on and the mm-hmm. description of this judgment. And it, and even Isaiah 24 through, through 26 is, um, is probably most likely localized to, Israel itself mm-hmm. at the end of the age and and the the judgment according to the covenant with Israel um not not the covenant with Noah even mm-hmm. though some commentators do see a connection between uh the the verse 5 the everlasting covenant in verse 5 they some commentators make that connection back to the everlasting covenant of of uh, Genesis 9 okay um but but likely what the context here is is uh is actually within Israel and not a broader kind of cosmic idea but um but yeah what you have in in verse uh, in chapter 26 verse 20 um you have this kind of interesting idea of it says come my people enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you hide for a little while until indignation runs its course and it's talking about the Lord's going to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth or the land for their iniquity. And so it kind of has this almost like this language of get in the ark. Yeah, right. It know? still invokes that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a like sheltered hiding place to to um, be sustained for the wrath to come. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, seeing seeing this language again, it's all within these eschatological contexts of judgment and that that instruction being kind of a foundation point for people to to have this past event in their minds. And so um another another one, you know, moving forward in the prophets and the minor prophets is uh in Zephaniah chapter one, verse two and three, uh the Lord says, I will completely remove all things from the from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. Um, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And so obviously really intense. Yeah, what is that reference? And that's, and I'll jump in. That's even um, more devastating than the flood. I think one thing that's interesting to note in the flood, um, I'm not sure the exact passage, but uh, basically, the fish of the sea are spared because <laughs> they need yeah. oxygen from the water, and the you know, water is always there. And sure, many of them died in the the cataclysm, but um, the Lord specifically doesn't include them when He He talks about. Um, yeah. But then he, now He does, and so maybe this is an allusion to the the fire or or some other judgment that yeah. that would reference them. Interesting. Yeah, and it's uh, and it, it uses uh, even some of the the language here of the removal and kind of wiping it all away mm. um kind of is like the the same ideas of of wiping and totally total destruction what but you said it even you know yeah. the actual when you break down all the pieces yeah. you know it's it seems even more which here he, he's talking about in reference to uh, the nation again. Um, mm-hmm. And in verse four, it says, I'll stretch out my hand against Judah. So he's talking about within the bounds of the covenant with his people. And so uh, it's against Judah, Jerusalem is, and he's coming to cut off the idolatry and all of these things that are happening in the land. And so um, the, the language is very intense talking about the extent to which he will go, you know, in mm-hmm. his jealousy for his people. Yeah. 
Um, but to turn used, them away from idols and preserve a remnant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But he's using this this language of the flood and and what's happening here. But um, and, and finally, in in the Tanakh, we, there's a lot of these kind of subtle allusions throughout. But um, the the last passage that we have here is Amos five, verse eight, and it says, um, "He who made the Pleiades and Orion." And changes deep darkness into morning, uh, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. And so the, the same one who stretched out the heavens and, mm. and set the constellations and the stars and uh, Pleiades and Orion and these, uh, these different, you know. <laughs> it's interesting to figures. invoke that. I would love to know like what the... Because those are Greek words, right? And so yeah. how are they conveyed in the, the Hebrew scriptures? It's yeah. interesting. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and you know, the same one who does all of that, it's like he's pouring out the waters on the earth. And so the idea of like um, even uh, what we what you alluded to earlier mm -hmm. is like the fountains of the great deep bursting open, but then also there's that kind of picture of the mm -hmm. heavens open from from the from a man's perspective yeah. you know yeah he's he's on the earth and he's seeing the, the water just come coming up. from both sides right yeah, yeah. And you're, you're hemmed in and then the only place to secure is in the ark or in that yeah that prescribed place of refuge wow. yeah and and obviously the event like what we said on monday too the flood itself um was kind of like the uh god bringing the disorder you know, because he brought mm -hmm. the order by separating the waters. And it's almost like he's he's con bringing the convergence of the waters again into like this cataclysmic thing. And so it's almost like the decreation and then recreation idea. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting when you said that, you know, it's picked up in, in Second Peter, but it's like that they forgot that the earth was created out of water. And we go back to the Genesis account, but then it was recreated out of water after the, the flood as well. Yeah. And so that's, that's interesting. That's to awesome. Think about. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just backtrack a, a tick. And cause I did find totally. that passage, uh, Genesis six, seven. Um, and the Lord said, I will blot out man who I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things and to birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. And so, you know, in the Lord's mind, he already knew that the way in which he was going to do this judgment was, was through the waters because he excluded the, the fishes there. Mm. Interesting. Wow. And uh, obviously he, I guess that's interesting as well, sort of a sovereignty of, of God discussion, but the mechanism, if, if the hydroplate theory is correct, then the mechanism for bringing about the flood was, initiated at creation and and then that's something interesting and profound to think about um and and possibly the result of the flood and you know sort of this um earth that's all you know separated into different components and then has this you know liquid magma underneath you know volcanic eruptions there's a lot of imagery of of uh, earthquakes and mountains being shaken and so the mechanism for the eschatological judgment was even created at the flood wow and so you just see that you know um it's not this open theism right where he's just trying to figure out as he goes yeah he has a very set goal and and uh, plan in mind to um, reveal the sons of god and and uh and save his followers so it's, yeah it's pretty profound that's awesome wow so let's uh, let's just move forward into just two sections. We're going to hit Second Peter three, but that was what you brought up is mm -hmm. really awesome there. Um, and we're going to kind of go through a little bit of Second Peter three, but let's move into the New Testament um, and just look at a couple little sections here. Um, one of the the big ones is the lips of Jesus, um, who talks about the days of Noah. Um, in the Olivet Discourse, which the Olivet Discourse is in the the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptics just means seen together, uh, together optic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So they're, uh, they're seen together in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it has the, uh, the framework of him talking about the end of the age. And we're just going to look at Matthew's here, uh, Matthew 24, 
37, he, it says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in the, those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the, uh, the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. And there will be two men in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. And so the, this this idea of the days of Noah become the, the paradigm and the instruction related to the coming of the Son of Man and the end of the age. Um, and so uh, the flood, again, serves as kind of this like type of in time judgment and uh and here again it says the flood came and took them away and it so the, the taking of the flood is mm. taken in judgment it's actually yeah. that, so that sort of flips on its head the paradigm of being taken or rescued out of this coming deluge uh, yeah interesting yeah so these guys here the the those taken and left the the, to be taken is actually kind of the negative side of you of want to be left. On. You want to be left behind, is <laughs> yeah. what we're saying, guys. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I think that that's really interesting. And a lot of times too, you'll you'll get people invoking passages of no one knows the hour, or the time, or, or the day, and um, and like the the flood of Noah, the reprobate, right? Those that were not found righteous didn't know they were eating and drinking and marrying, and Noah and his family knew intently and they had committed, you know, a hundred years to forming this vessel to survive it. And so yeah. I think you just push that on into the eschatological judgment where the followers of Yahweh will know and there's there's signs and, and so it's not just this mysterious thing. Yeah. Um whereas the unbelievers will be caught off guard. Yeah. Like a thief in the night versus so, good. so um but I just think it's really good when you can couch all that back in the flood and we can glean things, you know, that are going to play out from from how Jesus is invoking that. Yeah, so good. Yeah, I think I think it's like uh just thinking about how how desperately we need wisdom mm. in in fearing God to be able to order rightly in light of the judgment. And that's just a consistent theme of like wisdom and watchfulness. And it's like why would he continually like call them to watch, be ready, mm -hmm. you know, like this over and over again if it's like you're never going to be able to see anything. You're never going to, be able to like discern yeah. anything. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. even make sense. And so the way that uh, some theological constructs about the end kind of set people up for, for being unprepared and, mm -hmm. and even like spiritually and, and yeah, in their, tough. their confidence and clinging to God and reliance. Um, actually, it's not actually learning from the instruction mm -hmm. related to, these things about the end of the ages, it's, it's uh, it, it kind of circumvents yeah. the process that's really intended to help us. Yeah. And have it wisdom. sheds more light too on the opening of this passage where he's just like, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. And it's like, how are we going to be deceived? Like we have it here. And, and, but that's a real, you know, warning and admonition to not take on these other narratives that, that sort of fly in the face of, of scriptures and, and what he said. Yeah. Hmm. So good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, um, big, big picture stuff of the flood. Also the, uh, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah are, are big. Both of those kind of serve as, um, these are like major divine judgments in, mm. in Genesis. Obviously the flood is much bigger and much more grand in, in scope. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but, they serve again, you know, over and over in scripture as the, these like types for the end. And really like Sodom and Gomorrah kind of um, smaller scope and, mm -hmm. and the fire yeah. language kind of really lends itself a lot towards like the, the day of judgment and, mm -hmm. and you know, the smaller scope kind of has context of like more localized judgments mm -hmm. and stuff of like cities and stuff. So it's used throughout the prophets and, and even by Jesus in uh, other places here about uh, the end, but they both kind of serve as these major instructions related to uh, what's to come in the day of the Lord. And so um, let's look at one more. Um, I think we have some time to do, 
to do one more here in Second Peter three, which is a huge, huge thing, and even the 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 translation of it is uh, can be a, a little difficult here and there with different words. And um, we're actually going to read this this section here from uh, the translation. Um, a friend of ours uh, did a translation project here. Um, it's the Blessed Hope translation. And uh, we can put a link to that as well. Um, uh, all of the New Testament is available in this translation. Um, and what what's actually really great is um, you can you can read and look at their uh, just copious footnotes all throughout of um, his decisions in words and translations and backgrounds and uh, passages that connect to it. And so it's really helpful. You can actually use it as just a study tool in and of itself. Mm. Um, as you're just reading through the new Testament, um, looking at some of the, the footnotes and things that, that he uses, but second Peter three, um, we have here, uh, and just start, we'll just start reading here this section and kind of, uh, comment as we go. But, uh, second Peter three, three, he talks about, um, well, let's look, start at verse two, the first part here, he talks about remembering the words spoken beforehand by the prophets, the commandment of the Lord and the things spoken by the apostles. And he says, understand this as of first importance, there, there will appear in the last days, brazen scoffers who, whose conduct will be governed by nothing but their own evil desires who will say what happened to this promised coming of his? So the, talking about the, the coming of Jesus. For the things are the same now as they were when the patriarchs died. Everything continues on exactly as it, as it has since the world was first created. They deliberately forgot, you see, this fact. It was a certain heavens and a certain earth that existed long ago, holding, to, holding together in their proper arrangement by God's command out from water and by water by means of which things the world as as it was at that time when it was deluged with water experienced utter ruin and destruction the heavens and the earth as they are at present however by the same command are stored up with fire holding god's weapons in reserve for the day of judgment when he will heap ruin and destruction on ungodly people Yet you must deliberately remember, dear friends, this one thing. One day in the Lord's sight is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, in the way certain people themselves think of slowness, but is being slow to anger and, and patient with you, not wanting anyone to suffer ruin, but everyone to come to repentance. Then he goes in and he starts talking about in verse 10, Now the day of the Lord will arrive like a thief, at which time the heavens will pass away with a crackling sound, rushing and violent, and the elements burning with fierce heat will be unleashed, and the earth and the things done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are in this way to be unleashed, what kind of people ought you to be with respect to holy conduct and godly deeds as you await and urgently desire the arrival of the day of God? That day will light the spark and the heavens blazing with fire will be unleashed and the elements burning with fierce heat will melt. Yet in the end, it is the new heavens and new earth in keeping with his promise that we await in which righteousness will prevail. And so um, th this this section, he, he actually he goes back to the flood and he's he's attaching even like the idea of the the mocking mm. and where's the promise of his coming even is is the idea that people are like willfully ignorant they they kind of have this like blindness that this thing happened in the past like this this event that god created and then at that time the world was destroyed with water mm. you know it's like it's crazy to think about like the forgetfulness of man related to there was a real event in the past that that God came and judged mm -hmm. human wickedness on like a prolific scale, mm -hmm. you know, and that people are like totally 
walking in darkness around that idea as if like we're, we're totally unaccountable, you know, for the future. And it just reminds me too of like how easy it is to explain away, right? Like there's views that it, even within the church that it was just a local flood. And so, you know, this is Jewish scriptures and this is something they're remembering. Um, and that sort of negates like this understanding and, and expectation. Um, and then, you know, a great example is like the fossil record because by and large, like that all originated from the flood. And so <laughs> we have like whole museums dedicated to this like appreciation of the judgment of God and expectation of a coming judgment. And, and I think it's interesting too, like in a pastoral sense where it, it picks up like the disbelief is, is rooted in your own evil desires. And like, it's a lot nicer mm -hmm. not to think about these things, right? It, yeah. it would be nice if this wasn't the way. And so I think that so much of, of the debate, you know, between science and creation and following God and, and following the world is not rooted in these great academic arguments, but really it's an emotional desire. It's like, I want to take from the tree. I want to like choose my own way. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 it's really profound. And, and then the last little piece that kind of jumps off the page to me is um, this view that kind of everything continues as it's always done. And and that's sort of the evolutionary model. It's like, and geology for sure, it's just like incremental uniformitarianism, just very small little changes, mm -hmm. a millimeter here, a millimeter here, a millimeter here. And God's saying, no, like, you know, my whole testament is to show you that I do act very deliberately and, and apocalyptically at, at times. And, um, and it sort of, you know, recaptures that. I just yeah. really like how that, how that pulls it in. Um, what do you make of the translation of the, the unleashing? I, I, I've read different translations. I've never really seen that as, yeah. as far as what's the choice there. I guess I need to read his footnote and yeah, get uh, the Bible, right? Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is in print as well. So yeah, we'll we, could totally, to that. <laughs> uh, we yeah. could totally pull up yeah. some, some more on, on his, uh, this idea, but, th but this passage actually becomes a major passage for, um, the idea that, you know, earth uh, will be, will be totally burned up one okay. day, you know, yeah. it's like yeah. the whole, uh, the heavens w will, uh, dissolve and mm -hmm. melt and, and this thing. And even these words that are used here, I, you know, it's helpful because, um, like words like, uh, in the new American standard, like in verse 10, it'll talk, it'll say the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be destroyed, but the word for destroyed is actually from the word to be loosed or to, to be like set free. And mm. they translate destroyed, but it's like through the paradigm of, of, you know, interpret it. Yeah. It's always translation is always interpretation. You have you this know? worldview and then we sort of mold the scriptures into saying that thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that, ac that actually a very similar um, word for that, that being loosed is, is used again in verse 11 all these things are to be destroyed in this way or to be loosed in this way. You, mm. And so I think uh, his translation here kind of t picks up that idea. And it's the, uh, it's the idea of things being unleashed, loosed. The idea of the judgment mm -hmm. is being mm. uh, reserved. And, and, and it connects to, if you, you know, go through some of the, notes here is the idea of um the lord had storehouses where he would store up like the hail for oh, the yeah. judgment of the great day Pick or things like job, this too. yeah and and yeah you said like the book of job and uh and possibly even the idea connected to uh the fountains of the great deep being storehouses for mm. the waters of the, that are used in judgment um you know in the flood yeah uh, it kind of has this idea of these things will be unleashed in judgment on the ungodly mm. at the day of the Lord. And so, um, so here even, uh, the idea that, uh, in verse 10, the, the words it, in the new American standard, it says, um, the earth and its works will be burned up. Mm -hmm. um, but the words for burned up are actually the words for exposed or discovered. Mm. And the, it's used again in verse, uh, in verse 14, he says, be diligent to be discovered by him or be exposed, mm -hmm. be found exposed by him in peace, spotless and blameless. 
if the the judgment is going to expose the the works of ungodly men on the earth you know you be uh diligent to be found and exposed by god mm. as blameless yeah. as spotless in light of the day it's like the instruction related to righteousness and so um some of the translation this blessed hope translation tries to preserve some of those ideas because really when you think about it the flood didn't destroy oh, that's such a great point yeah earth, it, it it reconfigured the earth and and so i think the heavens and the earth will be reconfigured and these elementary models of life and the way you know that we thought the world worked are going to be reconfigured by messiah and and then the the heavenlies being judged as well. Yeah. Uh, I love making that connection between like, essentially everything is going to be revealed. Everything is going to be unleashed. And, and one is unto the revelation of the, who were the sons of God. And the other is unto the, the judgment that's being stored up. And yeah. um, it just, it just makes so much more, more sense of that passage. Um, and, and just fighting for the perpetuity or the uh, continuation of the earth. Yeah. Um, and absolutely. reading this in light of that and not having to negate, or, you know, metaphorically allegorize all the things in the Psalms that talks about the the persistency of the earth um, where it, it's it's still here. I think another interesting piece, too, is that like the heavens will be unleashed. So we talk about the, the sons of God and all these other entities and deities and like they will become known to us and we will see sort of how the Lord shamed them through his Messiah and even, you know, his human creation that, yeah. that conquered, you know, you can pick up some stuff in um all over the Bible, but it's just yeah. interesting to pull all those thoughts together and see that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I you know, obviously we're not, we're not here to do a uh, breakdown of second Peter three. You know, there's so many things here mm -hmm. that we, you know, this is kind of a very cursory reading of. Yeah. And this section, tying but, it back to the flood and the, the use of that. Yeah. But, but I think that, the, you know, again, the, the point is like, it's the same rock, that continues it wasn't totally destroyed in the flood in the in the sense mm -hmm. that we kind of have that idea of it's all gone but the instruction is like this flood is is the really major type of what's coming and uh this is why in verse 14 uh I'll read the blessed hope here he says that is why dear friends as these uh, as these things you await you must do everything you can to be found when laid bare before him without stain or blemish and at peace. And so this is the, uh, you know, God, it even says here that this, the God is being patient and regarding that patient as, as salvation. It's like the time that we have now to be diligent for righteousness and be diligent to be found without blemish in light of what's coming and the, the judgment of God. So um, sobering stuff. Yeah. So uh, just before we, we have to wrap up, we're going to look at, a you know, one thing that we talked about um, on Monday was a, uh, was a little bit of a difficult passage, you know, Genesis nine of the, the what's going on with the curse of Noah's son and, and Canaan, why does Canaan get blamed? And we're not going to, you know, re re look at all of the, the different interpretive options, but one of the maybe less familiar interpretations was that um, we're dealing with a, a type of incest that took place between Ham and either Noah himself in one view or, or, uh, if you use the idiom that's that's actually um, used in like the book of Leviticus, and which would which would maintain language if if you hold that the Torah was kind of a uh, has a core that derived from Moses, and obviously there are pieces of the Torah that have been edited and added to, and things like this. Um, then the idiom would also be that him. Uh, had ancestral relations with his mother mm. and that could provide explanation for um, possibly the offspring of Canaan and why Canaan's cursed and how sure. that kind of moves forward into um, the lineage of the Canaanites. And this, this, you know, this kind of transgressed of human, human boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, 
um, that lays that goes forward even with uh, Lot and his daughters in Genesis, and they both kind of follow these judgment events, and they both end up kind of leading to the offspring of these enemies of Israel. Um, but uh, John and I were talking earlier, and you know John's background in in biology kind of. Uh, he he looks at some of these things and has an angle on, on from that background to be able to see them in a kind of a different light. And so let's just kind of revisit some of the things we were talking about yeah. earlier just quickly as far as the idea of genetics and some of these uh, things related to the book of Leviticus. Okay, and, yeah. Um, um, it's It's hard in our modern minds and culture because we just understand like holistically the incest is wrong. And, and so, um, but like those sort of engagements with close relatives weren't prohibited until Leviticus 18. And so you, you sort of wrestle with what was going on and like, did he did just want his people to be different from the rest of the nations. And there's an element of that, but there's also an element, I think of, of the genetics. And so if you appreciate that Adam and Eve, um, were made in perfection and that, that God was there sustaining them, um, then, effectively the way someone ages or the way disease enters a population is a breakdown in the replication of the DNA. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is over time mutations would form. And if you get one copy from your mother, one copy from your father, um, when those came together, you had two def defective copies that manifest in disease. Mm -hmm. And so wow. if you, you think Adam and Eve initially had perfect DNA. So the, the rate of mutation, even if it, you know, is consistent as it is, is today, there weren't a lot of things that could slow down man. And you, you see that buried out in the genealogies. If you hold the, you know, that's a real thing, live in thousands of years, live in nine, 800 years, yeah. because there's not these things that we compete with all the time, um, to, to, to pull down man. Uh, and you know, something happened at the flood where, where lifetimes were shortened. Um, but basically what happens is when you start, uh, interbreeding and forming progeny with your close relatives, you just increase the probability of having these two defective, um, uh, well, two defective co copies of the gene yeah. come together. Yeah. And so I think that's what David is alluding to, just the, um, the public health concern of God. And even just, uh, it's not these like, well, this is wrong. This is taboo. I'm trying to limit their, um, their boundaries. It's to uh, sustain and protect the population. Mm -hmm. um, and you even pick up things where, you know, we're in the middle of, of coronavirus. And so if we had all, you know, s stayed together in this clump population and all had some genetic predisposition to be taken out by coronavirus, then, then that is what would happen. And so by keeping the genetic diversity um, within, you know, the, the Jewish, um, people, but rather spread out and large, they're more resistant to, to calamity and different things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and just maybe to wrap up one little piece with that, if you imagine that the Lord said to Adam, when you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And he, he lived a thousand years. It's, it's possible that the maintenance of this replication of the DNA and, and um, safeguarding it against mutation was just lifted. And and presumably, maybe something contingent within the tree of life is required to restore that process. And yeah. so I think as a scientist, I, I really enjoy and, you know, I get cautioned all the time. You can't know everything, but I really enjoy thinking about the logistics and the mechanisms of things. And it going back to the, the flood narrative, even it just gives you a greater appreciation for like how these things might might play out. Yeah. Um, does that sort of. Yeah, so good. So good. I think just thinking about that, I mean, like, you know, the even the promises of eschatology related to, you know, in the through the day of the Lord yeah. is we have these pictures of I mean, this is not the subject matter of our class, but, <laughs> um, you know, these pictures of of Jerusalem being restored in a, in a restored earth mm. and the temple of God being built and the tree of life being there and people going up into Jerusalem to eat from the tree of life. I mean, it's like, mm. this is the picture of like restoration is that, you know, whatever was in that fruit, yeah. you know, it's like we're, we're given access again, you yeah. know, where Adam and Eve were, you know, they transgressed that boundary and it's like, 
okay, I'm cutting off the access. Yeah. You know, it's like we, we have that access again to as, as part of the inheritance of eternal life. And I mean, just thinking about those and understanding that mechanism, even it's just like, it makes it more tangible for mm-hmm. us, like to even think about how this could, could play out. Um, take from it and eat it. Right. And then it just becomes more real in your heart and inspires. Yeah. 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 It's good. So good. Well, may the Lord give us grace to, you know, respond to the instruction here and in looking at this, uh, this, this picture of the flood and what, what took place with this real event that took place in history and let, and letting that really drive us to fearing God and trusting him that he's, he's faithful to judge wickedness and sin. Mm. And in light of that, we can actually have confidence that as we're being diligent to, to be found in him and without blemish, spotless, blameless, you know, in light of the judgment that's coming, that he's going to, to vindicate, you know, righteousness and he's going to judge wickedness. And so the, this instruction helps us in, in, as we live our lives and expectation for what's coming. And so, um, thanks for the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy it. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll see you guys next week. So God bless you guys. Grace to you. All right. See ya.